Pode ser o Grupo Corpo ou a Companhia de Dança do Pantanal. Museu de Arte Moderna de São Paulo ou Arte em Cores. Filarmônica de Minas Gerais ou Programa Vale Música. Onde tem cultura, a Vale está. Dos projetos que todo mundo já conhece até aqueles projetos que todo mundo precisa conhecer. É valorizando essa cultura que crescemos e evoluímos juntos. Com o apoio do Instituto Cultural Vale, a arte popular é destaque no Maranhão. E o nosso papel é fazer com que elas sejam conhecidas, valorizadas. Vale, transformar a mineração hoje é transformar o amanhã de todos. É a cidade mais nacional do Brasil. É por isso que as Olimpíadas foram no Rio. E a final do Mundial também. O Maracanã é nacional. A Sapucaí é nacional. O Rock in Rio é no Rio, mas é nacional. A TV Globo nasceu no Rio, mas virou nacional. É natural que o jornal O Globo seja um jornal nacional. Porque ele é a cara de um país cuja cara é a do Cristo Redentor. O Globo, um jornal nacional. Ministério do Turismo e Associação Casa Azul apresentam Vigésima Flip Festa Literária Internacional de Paraty. O projeto conta com o benefício da Lei Federal de Incentivo à Cultura. Vale Mais Cultura. Tem patrocínio oficial do Instituto Cultural Vale. Patrocínio Itaú. Copatrocínio, O Globo. Apoio, Esquilo, Mac Móveis, Prefeitura de Paraty, Globo Livros, Unigel, CQSFV Advogados e Oceana. Concepção, Associação Casa Azul. E realização, Secretaria Especial da Cultura, Ministério do Turismo, Pátria Amada Brasil, Governo Federal. A FLIP é, é super importante, né? principalmente porque a minha relação com o livro começa desde criança, que eu lia tudo quanto era o que aparecia, porque naquela época a gente não tinha condição de comprar livro nem nada. E de repente surgiu a FLIP em Paraty, né? então para nós era uma coisa de rico, então eu não ia para a FLIP, até que depois começou a surgir a gente vendo a, a, a praça cheia de livro, as crianças da escola né, vindo fazer todo esse trabalho. E aí a gente acabou indo na Flip para dar uma olhada. O que é a Flip? Né? E aí chegou lá aquele montarel de livro e via falar que os escritores estavam ali e tudo. E incrível como paratiense ver aonde a Flip chegou, né? 20 anos dentro de Paraty, 
é, na verdade, para nós, é um dos maiores, um dos maiores eventos né, que Paraty recebe. E ela muda de várias formas, né? não só de leitura, mas de, de apresentar para as crianças, né, para a gente da, das comunidades, né, a, a leitura, né, que muitas crianças, às vezes, como eu, às vezes você não tem tanto acesso. Hoje tem muito livro, mas por quê? Tem a Casa Azul, né, tem várias outras. Então, para mim, a Flip me marcou muito, tanto por leitura, tanto por, por apresentação do nosso negócio, da nossa história, né, e economicamente também para a cidade, ela marca muito, porque traz muita, muito turista, né? muitas pessoas que vêm. E na verdade, numa única, num único objetivo, a paixão pelo livro. Flip 20 anos. Vidas que transformam lugares, que transformam pessoas. Escreva conosco essa história. Faça parte da Rede Amiga da Flip para continuarmos transformando juntos os próximos 20 anos. Acesse flip.org.br e faça sua doação. Good evening, one and all. And ask the permission of our ancestors, those who came before me, black women, white women, indigenous women, all the women who wove this web of literature, I beg permission and from Femina to recite a poem of hers. Please listen to the sound of the 19th century Portuguese, Brazilian Portuguese, talking about the solitude of a soul sleeping on the beach. In the wee hours of the morning, I turn over in pain. My soul does not awaken or even fill my chest. The beautiful in the dawn, the white crane pecks around in the water and the wind sighs sorrowfully like a abandoned lover and if in a graceful undulation the gentle swaying of the graceful palm trees and uh, coming to the waves come to break on the coast on the rocks, but I do not weep, listening to the morning, or don't feel on the breeze on the beach, in this slow, deep sleep, I don't pity, I have no pity, but my chest dies, I have no pity, but my chest dies, uh, I don't wake up, I don't have dreams, nor do I suffer any pain. What could awaken it now? Only a sigh, revealing love. Only a sigh that revealed love and gratitude. A free translation of a poem we received about 10 minutes ago. Good evening, I'm Fernanda Bastos, and together with Milena Brito and Pedro Meira Monteiro, we are conducting the curatorship of this special 20th session edition of FLIP. And one of the values of FLIP is precisely the title of this roundtable now, the free word. And for us to hear this free word, the spoken word, we call to chair this meeting, this incredible meeting, the journalists, 
reporter Annabella Montero and the participants of this roundtable. I'm going to call here in order in their positions. Lazaro Ramos, Midre, and Alice Neto de Souza. Welcome. So, good evening, one and all, everyone. Thank you for the invitation. Thank you to the curator, Fernanda Belen, and Pedro to lead this roundtable, this Portuguese-speaking panel in Parachi. I'm here again learning so much, being a long-term FLIP participant. It makes me very happy. And I would like to be able to discover Maria Femina Jesus, the creator of meanings, a pioneer of so many struggles and so many dreams and so many words. Her struggles are still those of our historical time, even though the formulations are different. What does it mean to be free for Maria Femina? What did it mean to write for Maria Femina, to be a woman for Maria Femina? What did it mean to be a black woman for Maria Femina? And what does it mean for being a black woman in Brazil and Portuguese for Alice and Midre? In Portugal and Brazil, so I'll introduce, attempting to stick to the possibilities of the authors. I don't want to confine them by the alphabetical order. Alice Neto de Souza was born in 1993 in Lisbon. Portugal. She has Angolan roots. She's a poet and artist of the spoken word. In the stages through poetry, she attempts to sharpen her tongue, quote unquote, on social emerging issues. And now she graduated and has a master's in rehab psychomotor rehabilitation. Alice de Neto. Alice Neto de Souza. Lázaro Ramos, the Lázaro Ramos. In addition to being a writer, filmmaker, and actor, he is the one who questions in this book, you are not, aren't you visible? Who am I? Who will I be? Who can I be? Lázaro quotes, amongst many references, Cesária Évora, Maria Tânia, Conceição Évaristo, and Ângela Maio. And he was born in 1978. Midre is a girl who was born with no color on the outskirts of Sao Paulo in 1999. She's a poet, social scientist, a future anthropologist, a tarot, uh, and a, a dancer of Frevo from Recife. Her recent book is called Love Letters to Black Women for black women. So, a memory of the body and dialogue between different languages and the positions between the fringes and the place, the consecrated place of hegemony is an inequality are some of the topics that are going to follow us over the course of this conversation. And ancestrality appeared in the word ancestrality. The first question is to write is it a form of assembling your genealogical tree in your family tree? On page 12, you have a family tree. Lazar, take it away. Okay, good evening. I know that we're talking about ancestrality, but there, we can't start a roundtable like this one without talking about my great joy to be with you here. My great joy to return to FLIP amongst other reasons. After the moment in which I think that I became an author, it was in 2017 when I came here precisely with a book that had been, had a lot to say about ancestrality. And look how things happen. This process of becoming an author, we know that we're vain, of course. I came here with Flippina, the kids version. Everybody talked about Lazaro, the actor. Nobody said that I wrote the things that I wrote about when I came back in 2017. Suddenly, that book, which was 
an anthology of things that I'd heard and experienced and learned with my ancestors began to generate a topic for discussion. I became an author precisely not because of the praise for what I was writing, but because of the people had grasped those words as their own. So for me, ancestrality is somewhat this, this collection of what I live and what I have to put in my books. And you're not invisible. It's this research, this need to say you're not invisible, to understand where I came from and especially what I need to build uh, where I think we deserve to go and reach. Mitre, to write, uh, you're setting up your family tree. Yes, it is part of assembling my family tree. Those of us who are born in Brazil, a country where with so many different ways our roots and our black indigenous origins are erased and effaced when we write. We attempt to think what we're experiencing today. We begin to look back and think of all this history that was the story that was denied. We're rebuilding this genealogical tree, although we don't have the names, the faces, but we know that kind of strength these people were moving and force for us to be able to reach here today. So uh, definitely it's a family tree is a marvelous metaphor to multiply because it has roots, leaves, and a trunk. And we're going to go into detail of these various different elements. But Elise, I'd like to ask you what it means to write in this dialogue with you and how uh, people receive you. So I think it's funny because sometimes I feel kind of a need to justify because I'm a Portuguese poet and people say that I have roots in Angola. I think it probably begins based on that, of this need that I have to realize that I'm Elise, but there's the first Elise who's the mother of my mother, my grandmother, this person who preceded me and is also part of my story in a more silent way. And for me, at least for what is my research, and increasingly also it has proven a, a mistake. I don't know how far I should go in that direction, but that's fine. Okay, in this round table, we have new artistic or other artistic persons, and your work handles words, but the body as well as a plastic raw material, which is shaped in this active way, and the influence, and it has an imprint in your body, the codes and the genres and the language itself is being dynamized and rather than having Alice and Midra who say or read words from their text, I'm going to ask them to perform their writing. Alice, go ahead. Oh, wow, you put me on the spot. Okay. I had to take a drink of water before I take that up. Of course. Poet. I was little. Primary school, innocent, but curious about words. I picked up the pencils, those with all the color palettes. Yellow brown, navy blue, color with pencil in hand. Without even hiding my confusion, I looked at the pencil and at myself because I was still young enough to sharpen the tongue, to ring the bells stuck in my throat, to say what I feel and what puzzles me. Teacher. Yes. What the hell is a skin-colored pencil? Flesh-colored pencil. I was reprimanded, a child of such low maturity, questioning authority, and I looked at the pencil, looked at my own skin, stared at that skin, at that flesh-colored pencil. A poet. That day I gave up talking about unicorns and making citations because being a poet is to speak of emotions, but I could quote Luis de Camões, Fernando Pessoa, without mentioning a black poet. So I thought I'd quote Martin Luther King or Nelson Mandela, just to be a nice fella, ignore the world's emptiness, muting my ears because they prefer a poem with the sun in the corner of the paper, the cloud is painted blue with no pain in the background. Speaking about what bothers you, sharpening the tongue? What does that matter? Because that day they made me a skin-colored poet with a sharp brownish-gray pencil in the fog of the seas before and always sailed my tongue as the pencil where I write the color of my feelings. 
Who will waste time writing love verses with these times, these storms, these cataclysms, these seisms, isms? And I know I could be one less poet talking about racism. What would they prefer that instead of the charcoal pencil, I should take a gun in my hand, be included in so many other statistics, news reports, that I hide behind closets or boxes of all sorts, that I'd never get to finish high school? You Portuguese is so good. I close my eyes, swallowing all the cliches. But don't you listen to Gizomba? Ah, of course you know how to dance. They say that while well, I put Arctic monkeys on, and it's very clear. The more talent, the more colored people tolerate, because Beyonce may be black, but what matters is the inside. I hear the words ricocheting on a bulletproof body. I see it from dawn to dusk. We stand strong for our mothers have calluses from thinking and our fathers whitish hands from working. We pretend to be strong. What else could we be in a society of molds trying to make sense of what we see, laughing at the echo afterwards, thinking Black Lives Matter is just another post to like? But Mushima Yuami is suffering. Breathe. Hands in the air. Let poetry fly like a feather. This skin-colored poet already painted her liberation letter. What is a skin colored pencil? Yes, we have to think about that verse. Midria, your turn. Uh, just to let you know, we did not receive this material beforehand, so it's going to be improv interpretation. Oh, come on. Uh, is everybody tense? They're all in a bad vibe. We need to do some cleansing, clean our energies and ethics. I was born in 1999. Lula was elected for his first time in 2001. I am a child born and from red, and I have a star on my... I have a star on my forehead and it will show us that I am a social assistant. I am mystical. I am more uh, an anarchist than a PT, a labor partner. I missed, uh, I had, I had uh, hope of a better Brazil. Do you feel all this pressure in the atmosphere? Maybe it's a time to use a little bit of a Reiki, do some collective meditation. Let's do some yoga to repair our history. I feel this pressure over my shoulders and I remember the sea of bones in the Atlantic so that my ancestors could come to Brazil. There's no scent of essential lavender that will do away with the Amazon scent and where you have the killing of the indigenous population. Now the uh, uh, raped Yanomamis and black boys that cannot play or dance to Orishas. I want to have a bioenergetic dance to help me and show the, my path back home. Maybe we can reconnect our roots because we are sometimes just bringing together the little uh, trees, temples, trips. If you thought of re-elected such a horrible person, it was probably four years in a spiritual retreat. But what we really need is a detox. We need green juice with most of Amida. 33 million Brazilians have adopted veganism because they have no other choice. And I asked my astrologist, what is the current moment of the cosmos, of this uh, retrograde moment that will Brazil bring Brazil back 500 years? The hell is here and now. And it was also with uh, the uh, PT government, with the invasion of forest and uh, incarceration. I asked my tarot, when will we have the first uh, trans Brazilian woman? The uh, Bach florals uh, remind me of the gold uh, from Africa that today will give us uh, our currency's value. It is uh, gold dripping in blood. How about the color of the eyes of our tyrants? So please don't uh, misalign my chakras. So I will use radical imagination to feel centered. I will guide my imagination. I am just a child born from uh, the red of the red dream that spirits will dance in populating the earth with what was stolen from us being given back to us on our knees 
And if we are entitled to a massage, our black mothers, to bring some incense to cleanse and fight. Lazaro, I put you in a very tight spot now. Big shoes to fill. Yeah. Well, I, I, I chose four excerpts from my book. Again, we do not have this material. Uh, I know sometimes I address youngsters, and I was uh, amazing performances these girls did, and I was thinking, how, how could I add to this? So I chose the first part that has to do with the experience of the uh, main character when he will leave uh, during the pandemic with his mask on and he is uh, violated because his face with that mask is considered an aggression. But just to give you a... but I'm going to read something else actually and this is it. This book here also talks about a girl, Vitoria, and she finds her mother's old diary and talking about her desires, what that mother wanted when she was a teenager. So to talk about another generation, what I represent here is actually another generation because I'm old and I feel old. So I want to read an excerpt where Vitoria, uh, when she finds uh, her mother's journal, and she would read what her mother wanted when she was a teenager. So it says, I wanted to be faithful to myself. I'm sorry. Now you're going to see how it's another generation. I need my glasses. I need my reading glasses or else I can't read. I wanted. I wanted to be faithful to myself, to be in touch with my friends, to be happy as I am without trying to please anyone. I wanted to write a book. I wanted to fall in love. I wanted to travel in a car without any uh, destination. I wanted to drink more water. I wanted to travel around the world. I wanted to uh, punch a corrupt man. I wanted to put a very thick pajamas and cover myself and turn on the AC so that I could feel I was living in Siberia. I wanted to do more sports. I wanted to do less sports. I wanted to not want anything. I want a new clothes or reuse an old clothes or not or not want a new clothes. I want to eat an ice cream once and get all dirty. I want to do a little bit of break dance. I wanted to dance. I want to go straight from a party to school. I wanted to go from the school to a party. I wanted to be maybe a counselor. Uh, I wanted to be with myself. I wanted to read more. I wanted to talk just with you and be pleased just talking just to you. I wanted to be a vegetarian. I wanted to decide my profession. I wanted to be more than one thing. I wanted to have uh, three uh, ear um, rings. I wanted to dedicate a love music. I wanted to eat cheese bread. I wanted to kiss underwater. I wanted to dance just like Gretchen. And I wanted to sing like Maria Callas or maybe Maria Bethania. I wanted to have a number of stories to tell you. I wanted to eat an apple and hold it in my mouth with my eyes wide open and the uh, bus stop just to see how people would look at me. I wanted to go to a concert of an artist that I don't like. I wanted to see a concert organized by me with a participation of Clara Nunes, Alcione, Elson Rose, Cartola, Gilberto Gil, Elsa Suor, Jair Rodriguez, and also uh, Mick Jagger and Prince. One challenge there to see who will dance and better and sing to me better. I wanted to uh, climb a mountain, I wanted to spit fire, I wanted to dance without any kind of music accompanying me in the street, a windy street. I wanted to learn how to be uh, Roman and I want to um, accept my mistakes. I wanted to understand that there are no failures or success. I wanted to sleep on a hammock or maybe a giant bed. I wanted to study philosophy. I wanted to study medicine. I wanted to give some an unknown person a gift. I want to date without thinking that I needed to get married. I wanted to marry without forgetting uh, how to be a boyfriend and girlfriend. And I wanted to die.
just to be reborn. So we are all being reborn. This is a moment of transition and it's a very uh, fertile and powerful uh, that this idea of being reborn. Alice is uh, has a very uh, unquiet nature and your poet poem uh, poet and uh, this poet has already uh, painted her liberation letter. Alice, why is uh, this poem read more than written and published? This is a longer story. I was looking at my text there and how much time we have, but uh, basically what happened during my life or journey, I always like to write poetry more uh, for me than for others. And uh, so I, I start to think about how it was done for the, the first election of uh, Montomé to talk about uh, black uh, Portuguese speaking uh, countries. And at the time there was nothing written that will mirror that. So I was talking about, well, maybe instead of uh, going to what I already have from that author, I'll try to write. This is where this uh, poem comes from. This is the poem that is better known of mine and I saw that maybe through the, s the spoken word there is a verse from Luis, José Luis Pestato that say we're, we're burning different contexts and now as we saw here on stage the words will jump and it's easier to reach people because the words jump in the performance and this is why I like the spoken word. Midria. I was missing the applause. Midre, you say that you write, I wanted to write without being uh, pissed. And this is uh, in this book, Cartas de Amor para Mulheres Negras, a love letter for black women. And uh, so I'm going to repeat, I want to write without being enraged. And I wanted to write less me and more us. And these are two important issues here, in my understanding. One is that there is a collective memory that is being rebuilt and that lives in the first person, but it refers to a collective institution. And then this rage, this is engagement. It's a very political uh, dimension, which also is seen in your writing. Is rage uh, maybe a trigger for, you, for what you do, for the way you write and your performance? Well, this uh, reflection is because I participated in this movement, the SLAMS, uh, which is a spoken poetry uh, competitions. This exists since the 80s and they come to Brazil in 2008. Just to give you an idea, I mentioned there are more than 250 communities, SLAM communities mapped in Brazil. 250. So there's something very strong in this space, which is uh, the aesthetic that was created, especially here in Brazil, of uh, talking about issues related to resistance, uh, the struggle against uh, male chauvinism, uh, LGBTQ phobia. And we're not the first generation who's doing this. There are people who have been doing this for decades, seconds. But if Emina was doing that, so we do this with a greater intensity and every week, every day, every Saturday, every Friday we're there talking about that, that resistance and sometimes we are just opening our veins and our, uh, uh, we are showing and things in a very painful way. It's like reliving this pain. And when I say that I want to write without this rage, it's not just because I want to stop writing about these things, because we need to continue writing about these things as they exist, as they are a problem that will stop us uh, from having a well-being, to, to live a good life. But also, we have to start writing about different futures. What are the places that we want to collectively build for our lives. To talk about pain is essential and they are the starting point that will build our trajectory, our identity. And the story that we live collectively here in this country is the story of pain, mostly pain. So I guess the great challenge we have is how can we uh, come from a positive uh, a place with a proposal so that we're not limited to our pains. <laughs> Lazaro also has a, a new book 
at, at the end, of course, uh, I might forget it yet, so I might as well say it now. At the end of this session, we will have uh, the autographs at the end, uh, but it's, uh, the book is called The Vocino Invisible, You're Not Invisible, and uh, there is this uh, excerpt here. Little by little, he opens his uh, sister's room. The diary is on the first uh, drawer with two books. They are still wrapped. It's an edition of letters to my uh, daughter from Maya Jalou and uh, Flavia Lizin Silva. And uh, he leaves the room and he reads another couple of pages. So not only these references, they are the references, but what I find amazing is that you sometimes offer this book to Conceição Evaristo. You dedicate it to Conceição Evaristo. And you always, who always let us uh, travel through books. Are there many references, many meetings, but also bumping into people, which are important in our trajectory. So I'd like to hear you about that. Well, these uh, meetings or bumping into people are uh, from a place of curing, of uh, healing. This is why I refer to many people, because I, I was listening uh, to you, Midri, and I was so moved by you, because this is a topic that I've been thinking so much about. How can we create this bridge to the future, more a healthier future, especially when we are living a life a, a moment of so many authorized violence, applauded and voted violence, chosen violence, the slack of communication. And I was listening to what you had to say, and I was moved by it, because things, you know, will come through our minds, and even very recent thoughts, things that I've met today, can no longer help us understand what is necessary. This is a uh, uh, something I said, the place is wherever you dream you'll be. And I do not agree with that sentence anymore. It's not true because we live so di uh, dystopia and I guess a utopia will so save us. And this utopia will come exactly from what you said, this extreme love, this extreme affection, this uh, indignation, uh, rage. And this healing place, which are these bumping into people, I can find more words that literature has offered me. Conceição Evaristo is to whom I dedicate this book because of that. Because in many moments of uh, solitude, loneliness, of not knowing who I was, I can read Conceição. And she explains to me something that was a bit confusing to me until then. And this is what is beautiful, to be able to talk about this here on FLIP, to talk about literature as a place of healing, because it is something that I find healing every day as a writer and as a reader. I would like to uh, tackle a matter that is present in uh, the poems of uh, Alice uh, and uh, Neto Souza in Namibia that has to do with subversion of expectations to go against what is statistics and the predestination. Midria says, among the most important things that I've learned in life is to laugh in front of the statistics and subverse uh, the wide expectation of what my destination should be. And Alice, uh, with regards to prejudice and expectation, says, I know that I could be less uh, another poet talking about racism, but I, uh, what would they want from me instead of a charcoal? Should I uh, use a weapon? That so many statistics and uh, would be part of the news, and that I would never finish school. Alice, are these statistics and this uh, predestination, this uh, the pleasure? of laughing in the face of statistics to subverse the wide expectation of my destination. This is in Portugal. I would talk about statistics, I guess. I guess I, uh, normally when i thinking about poetry, poetry is a place where I uh, try to talk about my difficulties and understanding. And this uh, uh, poem, uh, Poeta, uh, deals with this. Uh, and. Uh, the isms I refer to, because I, I study, I'm, I'm a poet, but I also have a master's in uh, physical therapy. And uh, I, I, I work with uh, juvenile delinquents, and it's, uh, of course, that's the expectation that people have on us. Some of them I say, what do you want to do with your life? I want to work in a restaurant. Well, they're nothing against it, but 
from the, these people are based on a principle that they cannot go a little bit beyond that. So this understanding of what we want for our lives, what is the expectation, what other people expect of us, and related to me specifically, but I'm here, instead of, instead of should you want me to uh, put, hold a weapon instead of drawing? And I said, okay, well, I'm a master's. Yes, oh, you have a master's. Yes, I do. I thought you speak such good Portuguese. Of course, I was born in Portugal. So it's sometimes a bit confusing trying to explain to people uh, th to be in this place that is not also what expected when some uh, person cert reaches a certain level or, and also allow people to question this destination, this destiny. And I wrote this poem and uh, what I, I didn't expect that it would reach so many schools and children and uh, referring to what uh, have to do with uh, juvenile delinquents and uh, the weapons in hand, the gun in your hand. And uh, a, a teacher was talking to, me about, uh, talking to me about a student, that a boy that, was, uh, that didn't behave well and then she showed to this boy my poem. The next day he came and he wrote a poem and, and we sent it to an association and all of a sudden uh, she's, uh, he's uh, reciting poetry. So just, you know, bringing a poet to the attention of the students. If we believe in people, if we show that there are different ways of existing, of expressing ourselves, how far can we go? We can go beyond uh, statistics. That I'm an, a bit of an outlier, uh, a bit of a, outside of the system, but you don't have to be. It could be the standard. It could be mainstream. Uh, believing in people, believing in people and believing in oneself. In the love letters, Midre has even a, she teaches to write love letters to oneself, which I think is great, a good start. But I would like to hear from you about this issue of laughing in the face of the statistics and subverting the white expectations and do this with this new diction which comes from the peripheries and highlight the plural. It's not just from the periphery, from the peripheries, the peripheries in the plural, the Brazils, the languages were in the diversity and plurality. That's what we're talking about. Okay, I think it's a good issue. This is a great question. Uh, all the questions have been great actually so far, but this leads me to think in different directions. The first thing is this issue of plurality. I think that plurality it is born precisely from subjectivity and individuality of each person who brings a little bit of what they want to show to the world. And within the serenades and the slam uh, contest, this is very intentional and proactive and these agris, uh, uh, she talks a little bit about this, this, this agra, slam is an agra where democracy is performed. Think of a space where anyone who has a poem three minutes and doesn't have to be a great poem. Any poem, you wrote something in my cell phone and I want to s recite it. That's cool. You're going to be heard by several different people, different people. And in this direction, I believe that when we write, we are subverting the white expectation that we should be silent, that we should not speak, that we succumb, that we should accept the narrative as the only possible narrative the one that's imposed us, then the only path, the only direction. I grew up in an interracial family. I think this is an important point to bring for us to think about what blackness is in Brazil, which is this very complex thing. My father is a black man. He had four white wives, different ones. And my mother, as a white woman, always had this expectation that I should uh, straighten my hair ever since I was a young kid. When I was still a young girl, I heard her saying, because Mija wants to have uh, her hair like Sandy, her straight hair. I don't never remember having said that I wanted to have straight hair, but my mother, that was an absolute truth, a gospel truth. So when I was 10, 11 years old, I began to relax my hair and then smooth and straighten my hair and did this until I was 15. When I stopped straightening my hair at 15 years of age, I underwent a process, a very violent process of a lot of psychological violence, material violences in school, on the street, at home. And so this is important process saying, no, I am going to use my hair the way I was born with. I'm not the only one. And that's where the collective stories come in. There's all this movement of many black women, Brazilian black women who underwent 
capillary transition in recent years. This is an essential process for self-recognition of our identity and our roots and ancestralities and a political act as well of aesthetics in dialogue with the way that we're viewed and the way that we want to, where we want to take our stand in the world. So I think that we subvert the statistics when, for example, a statistic, obviously we have to subvert a lot of other statistics as well, but a statistic is how much hair straightener was, has been sold in recent years, how much is sold now. I think it's probably dropped a slight bit. Various different hair straighteners, <laughs> curl softeners, and so forth. Carolina Maria Jesus, this is 1958. I pick up, I'm a paper picker, but I don't like it. I pretend that I'm uh, reading. I got out of bed at 3 in the morning because when we lose sleep, we begin to think of the misery around us. I got out of bed to write. So to write. It's a way of dreaming, rather, and thinking and reacting to that reality. Thinking, writing is the dominant verb today. It's Lazarus, take that away. I believe that for the world to act on reality, but at the same time it's to deal with the uh, restlessness that we have and anguish because I continue to ask and wonder about the themes that are the books and the languages and I think that the languages that I experiment with have come to give some health to this process of visiting these pains because even if it's a book, a playful book, a book which tests and experiments with languages. Even so, when we investigate and study our experiences, this gives us an anguish and restlessness. So I write to deal with this restlessness. It's not like psychotherapy, but it's an attempt to use the resources that entertainment has to touch the hearts of more people than those who think about the topics that I am able to deal with in the books. This is a new kind of restlessness I have, the attempt to not to speak to my bubble, to attempt to attract more people, attempt to be clearly clear enough, but not even this suffices because even this attempt to control one's voice to speak about a subject we know, which is that it's urgent and important, even so it's a source of affliction to write for myself is not a comfortable place. It's a place of a lot of conflicts, but it's a place where it, I think it's necessary because I perceive that lit what literature is doing with this country. And I really hope and believe that it will reach other people with each passing day. And I say this because I am absolutely moved to be here with you and to hear your words. I know that the time is running out now, and I would like to say that for me it's extremely important to see your generation with this shedding this light on the world and I come from a dip previous time and oftentimes I felt alone I felt that nobody understood me I felt that I needed to have a limit in my way of speaking to find your poetry your poetics was another way of healing myself so thank you very much In a word, to heal is a word that has been said all across the flip. Several words, the new lexicon, it's part of this flip that I've been attending almost all of the roundtables. And to heal is one of these constant words in this lexicon of flip. And it's beautiful because we're just in the place of pain. We're not just in the place of pain and not just talking about our past. We're talking about it in this present tense, in this sense of urgency, but <clears throat> issuing and emitting a message to the future and those who are with us, uh, signals and, and signs of love. At least I'd like to hear about this healing and uh, restlessness based on this fragment by Carolina Maria Jesus. I was thinking about various words that Lazar was saying. I'm not talking about restlessness specifically, but I would say that there's several different uh, restlessness is the schisms recently I wrote a poem about uh, Muniz as well and what I began to think was that what does it mean to write for me I have a freight is this not me somebody wrote it it's in English which says and it says I hate writing but I love having written 
I hate writing, but I love having written. The process of writing is not always a f happy. On the contrary, my poem already being something of uh, dies for me, but this place of poetry, I can transform the pain. It's not exactly just a healing, but it's a process of transforming what I see to give back to others, but also in a place of restlessness to provoke this feeling, to create an impact. This is the poetry that makes me, I wouldn't say happy, but more satisfied as a poet. Could you talk specifically about the Portuguese context, because Lazaro and Midre are Brazilians in this discussion and the topics, the post-colonial topics, is all across the world, through and it crisscrosses the entire world. But there are these different, the various different continents and different countries. And here, it's, there's a very different movement than the one that we knew in Portugal. And I would like to hear you about what you feel specifically. You were born in 19, what? 90, 1993. So we're talking about a young woman but I remember just that our democracy started a revolution. It was 1974, the revolution of the Carnations. We're talking about a country which had democracy, mature democracy. When you were born, it was already had a mature democracy. But to talk about the relationship between Portugal and racism, it then had gone 40 years under, before the revolution. We had, for the first time, a person in the government was a black person and a woman. It was Francisca Ventura. She says, this says something about our relationship with racism. It was the first time that 40 years went by before we had a minister, a cabinet minister with a black woman. How do you feel this in Portugal? Thinking from the point of view, the poetic point of view of my poetic freedom, I recently wrote a poem which, Mars, which talks about this issue of freedom. What for me is freedom, not just freedom of expression. In this poem, I say several different things because freedom, and we think that we are free, but we are not totally free. The freedom that I talk about sometimes, as people say, as the way that I see the world from the poetic point of view, it, uh, sometimes it's part of the family, it's somebody to begging on this for food on the street. This is a point of view of what is the way that the world is built. Because how can we talk about freedom with people begging for food on the street? We have two questions. I'm going to launch this question here, which is for Lazaro and Isabella. Isabella, the title of your book is appears to be an advice to young people. Why that you're not invisible? Why did you choose this title? You are not invisible. Have you ever felt invisible because you were a black person? Yeah. The feeling of w worthlessness was present throughout my life once in a while. It still comes back. It's something that I would not like to have that I talk with every day, but it is an experience that in part of a black person's life and it remains with me everything, even after living everything away. I began to write this book. I didn't know that it was a book for young people. I didn't know that it was a book for adolescents in general, since I write without readership and without deadlines, without obeying and complying with the publishing house's contract. So I write with a certain degree of freedom. During the process, I discovered that it was a, pro a book for young people because they contained things that I would like to have heard in my own youth. I would like for someone to have said that you are not invisible, you are important, that you are beautiful, that you can and should have goals. And that's when I began to write this book, there was something very interesting that happened to me. I began to go into greater depth with young people who live with me, and I realized that several different of the dilemmas that I experienced as a young black man are still in the young people today. And I realized that it was a quote that could be transformative Sometimes this, you say something, tell a story that I always tell of a t teacher of mine in the moment of my life when I was studying in a public school. This happened several different times, but I think it's exemplary. And I had decided to stop studying and quit school because I didn't think that I was going to have something relevant in my future. And I decided that I was going to work rather than studying. I was going to drop out of school. I needed to take money home. And I entered the school look and look of a teacher so as to alert and I had this look uh, that I was giving up. She could realize crestfallen. Dalina was her name. My teacher said, Lazar, are you okay? 
I said, okay, I'm fine, teacher. She said, no, it's not okay. You're not okay. I know there's something going on. I know that you're thinking about doing something that's not good for you. I'm going to tell you something. Boy, don't do it because there's a path. This sounds like simple, but it was liberation having heard that. So this book is my contribution precisely to that. I want young people to hear that there's a path. You're not invisible. You're important. You should be dream and have utopia and you're important for this country. That's it. <laughs> this book, uh, it's kind of experimentation with language, illustration, it incorporates letters, messages from social networks and a diary, it's sort of hybrid production and the characters deal with dreams and possibilities and choices and the dedication you say to my great-grandmother, my great-grandmother called Victoria, who's the beginning of everything. And Midri, I would like to have a round table just with this dedication of this book. Midri says the following, I think that those who came before me, although they don't, I can't name them, the poets, the peripheral poets, then to those who will still come, it's beautiful. Hear this, this echo that we f hear in your words. Alice says as well that there is someone before her, the Alice before her was her grandmother. At the very end, I'm going to ask you, how was your grandmother? This is a question which is rather difficult to w perceive. What I would say is that the most important thing is that there's someone came before me uh, from whom I received a story. It would take more time to, when I think of the first Alice having a uh, soap opera came on, something that happened to the soap opera, and rather than saying, uh, and say, grandmother, I said, I am, I said, the mother of my mother. And sometimes this shows the distance that we sometimes have with regard to our own stories, saying the mother of my mother and rather than my grandmother. Okay, another question that I have here. Actually, it's not a question. It's a request. We want to hear slash sir at least in major exclamation point. Hear slash see at least in major once more. I'm going to say my best best Brazilian. It's going to have to come down. Mid, do you want to begin? Okay. An, another poem. We want to hear slash see Alice and Mid once more. Exclamation point. Wow. It can be together. Okay. Let's go. I'm going to share here before. I entered, I was thinking that Eshu must bless my words with honey, Eshu the Orisha. I have a problem. My, I'm Aries, my sign. Another problem, I was born without color. For some people, I am white. For other people, I am black. For a lot of people, I'm brown, although that I heard that brown is a paper color and it's like a shopping bag. And when they say it's convenient, I was born without color because I was born in a country with amnesia that erases from the history all the records and symbols of black resistance, which whitens the population. And the, with each opportunity, they make redemption of Cain, their Mona Lisa, the. Uh, uh, the Miracle of miscegenation. What about the raping of the bodies that were born to be free and they raped their wombs that should not have never failed to be ours? I have another problem. Okay, I don't know how to do somersaults. And for some people, I was born without color and my skin sounds brown and my colorism is in brightening of the state that often meant that white, uh, my father, and may hate me, mutilate me. My, they straighten my hair. Black girls 
don't play with white girls, but we make an issue of putting in my text that black women are uh, loving themselves because why do they call me brown? It's um, like cafe, coffee with milk, and I like morena, I hot, and cocoa color, and also and be fetishized as all most perfect standard for a mulatto woman export style and at the end of the month. And I am a girl who was born without cut and I had the privilege of being a girl who has free access to the different spaces, but at the end of the day, I don't belong to any of them. Actually, I'm a girl who was born without color, but whenever it's convenient for somebody, blackness comes out in their eyes, and this leads me to think about the myth of racial democracy in Brazil. If you know where your great grandfather came from, you know that you're white, Italian, Portuguese. The only uh, emblem was that of the destruction of poverty. White people, if you don't have black uh, blood in your veins, you have it on your hands, and you should have had black indigenous blood that was built in Brazil. With everything in Brazil, Rui Barbosa Bolsonaro tried to erase slavery. They break the records of the Holocaust, so the, this needs for us to reclaim our roots and our teeth to understand that our people are the sons and daughters of Bandara from my Quilombo and Femina came from a Quilombo. Give us strength for us to not have sh feel shame of the stories and our bodies. For a long time, I was a girl who was born without color, but one day they shouted to me, Black girl, I answered. We, we have this thirst for life now and believe that it is possible that there is a way. Alessi? So I'm going to do what I do in my improvs and you can choose. I have two poems. One is March. I cannot promise I will know it by heart. But it talks about freedom, and then there is one, this capital, and it talks about the prostitutes of uh, Metros Martimutis, with what has to do with invisible capital or March? March, okay. You guys are a tough crowd. I said, I don't know if I'll be able to do them. I said, yeah, March, that's what you want. Okay. So, as it is, let's do it. March. I've, I feel the waters of March over my city and I have this poem that and I write it and I don't feel like writing it and I have this voice that will allow me to think about freedom. From my window I see the birds scratching the, s the sky. I see the birds falling and I see that it's worthwhile speaking instead of being in silence. A silence is like this so uh, afternoon it's like the beginning of the pain when it starts hurting it's this uh, will of grief of screaming we learn so much to shut up do you still know how to speak what does it mean to have a dead bird i am uh, walking under the rain i try to tattoo a bird in my arm because the rain which falls on me it's still from march but there there's more rain in my chest as if I was going to, uh, the, the, freedom, the freedom was a wind, as if they wanted to shut me up, as if I was missing blood in my chest. I feel the march rains on my feet. And I say it's uh, the, uh, the stones that hit me are from April, they are from centuries ago. It is another unemployed, it's another wind, it's uh, the homeless, and we have angst, we have red lips, we have... We have cannot shut up a whole country. It's the sound of a drug user in the corner. It is a freedom. It is a family. It's utopia. And I know that I'm a poet and I live in a utopia. But we're not all the same. The rain which falls on my head will fall on differently in another person's head. It is to cry. It is to hug mother, children, daughters. 
it is the wee hours and everything will be okay but maybe not and not we can't live just of food and uh, and water we have to give people souls freedom is more than a secret message it's not just a hint in the middle of the poem it's not about politics it's about being a poet and it's to be politically correct because we have march rains over our heads of our cities we have to stop breathing I feel the petals that are dying. I feel the petals are from April and they are from a thousand years. And we feel the rains of March and April. I still try to understand how this fear will leave me, as if I could feel the tiredness in my skin. This is what we started many years ago. And we say that these seas and, and waters uh, are from centuries ago. I feel the water of March. We, all, we listen to this in the songs. We see, we hear the birds. And I have to restart. Because even if I, um, I can't sing, I still can march, march, march. Uh, this was an improv, of course, we did not have this material, so we did the best we could. Now, just to conclude, maybe Lazaro wants to sing or dance or what have you. Maybe uh, some concluding remarks? No, I just want to say thank you, immense, a big, huge thank you for having the honor of coming back uh, to FLIP and this amazing place, a place that really transformed me. I have no idea what happened with my mind, with my life since 2017. Uh, Dona Diva, uh, I'd just like to say a hi to everyone. She's still in my life. And this was a story that will be forever in my life. And so good that we are concluding uh, listening so, to such beautiful words, motivating. They're painful, they are a struggle, but maybe these are words that might help us to live this new moment we need. And we need to work a lot still. Thank you. Lázaro Ramos, Lázaro Ramos, Alice Neto Souza and Midria.